broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Will's Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. Since the coronavirus hit Western nations in March 2020, we have seen a giant swing all over the West to big government to such a, a degree that we are forced to live our uh, daily lives at the behest of the what the, the government and their bureaucrats say, and that can, of course, change on a daily basis. In Australia and New Zealand, we've seen centre-left governments re-elected with voters re-endorsing their COVID lockdowns, restrictions and border closures. Uh, Donald Trump, who wanted to keep the US free and open during the pandemic, lost the 2020 presidential election to Joe Biden, whom his Democrat Party and state governors have been the leaders over there in lockdowns, mask mandates and restrictions. So in 2021, how do we make the West great again? Initiate a return to uh, private enterprise, small government, and individual liberty and freedoms. One way is to make sure the major centre-right parties across the Western world, including here in Australia, don't simply become big government light. How can that be achieved? Well, my guest today has offered a path forward. Uh, John Ruddick has been, for many years, a vocal advocate of internal Liberal Party democratic reform so that party members and even supporters uh, should be able to directly vote on who the party's candidates for election are, as well as who the state and federal leaders of the party are. He argues that this leads to more skilled and principled party candidates and representatives. His advocacy has caused uh, much disquiet over the years amongst uh, uh, the current New South Wales uh, party power brokers and hacks. His arguments in favour and uh, proposals for Liberal Party uh, democratisation are contained in his uh, 2018 book, uh, Make the Liberal Party Great Again. Uh, John is a regular panellist on Sky News programs, including Outsiders, and his written commentary has appeared in The Spectator Australia. John, welcome to Wilmsfront. Good afternoon, Tim. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you for that introduction. And now my first question is going to be a general question. How are you feeling about 2021 so far? We're in February now. Uh, we've had the two-circuit breaker lockdowns in, in Brisbane and Perth. Thankfully, in my city of Melbourne, we didn't follow uh, suit. Uh, Dan Andrews has kept his uh, promise to keep Victorians safe and open, and we've obviously got the, the vaccine rollout coming soon. Uh, what's your sort of vibe about... Is 2021 going to be better than 2020, or are we just in a groundhog year, as I call it? Yeah, look, 2021 is going to be 2020, the sequel. And often, often with sequels, they try to make it, you know, bigger and more dramatic. No, it's just, it's just, uh, it looks like it's going to be these people, COVID mania, rightly or wrongly, wrongly in my view, has proven Tim to be politically political gold. Jacinda Ardern was very good for her. Uh, Queensland, um, <clears throat> we're going to see it in Western Australia, which I suspect is, I'm pretty sure we're going to see an all-time record I, in terms of a lopsided vote. Um, and we saw, you know, Donald Trump was obviously politically damaged by the by the by COVID in in the United States. So it's helping the left. It it, it I believe what it's doing is it's fast forwarding what they wanted to do in, you know, sort of 10 years' time, which is, you know, ban conservatives from social media and, you know, just really ramping up the cancel culture. So it's a bit like global warming. You know, the, the, the facts now of the virus, of this, of this once in a quarter century bad flu, the facts have now become quite irrelevant. Um, it's, it's, it's disconnected from the real world. It's just become its own thing and it's uh, not a good thing. Now, going to the contents of your book, uh, which is Make the Liberal Party Great Again, I'm going to put forward to you a, a devil's advocate uh, position. Right. Isn't the, the, the Liberal Party, particularly the New South Wales Liberal Party, already great again? I mean, the party is in its third term of government at a state level, Gladys Berejiklian. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she's 
been given the or talked about as being the the gold standard when it comes to uh, managing the the virus and and not shutting down and they've also the new south wales liberal party provided four of the last uh, liberal prime ministers and they the party has governed federally 19 of the past 25 years okay well the the good question and uh since federation the non-labor side of politics has won about three and four elections so it, it's always been lopsided in this country and that's because the stupid labor party continues to be connected to the unions but well look on the gladys situation yes she is the gold standard for australia but she still gets a three out of ten in my book i mean the gold standard is sweden okay and what has happened you're right that the new south wales liberal party has had the four most recent liberal prime ministers it even go, goes back goes back really andrew peacock and um and alexander downer very briefly were the only non-new south wales leaders we've had you know for most of my lifetime now in the first half of the liberal party's existence victoria dominated the leadership of the federal liberal party robert menzies harold holt john gorton uh and billy snedden uh not prime minister but opposition leader uh then oh, um uh, then fraser of course and then peacock so what has ha and new south wales in all that period had one leader uh billy mcmahon who was only there for you know a year or so uh two years so uh why has the new south wales liberal party in the last um last 30 years 40 years completely dominated the, the, the party room in canberra well it's, it's not that they're producing better people i can assure you of that because we should be having prime, parliamentary leaders from perth and queensland and tasmania everywhere uh so it, there's something going on why is new south wales dominating well it's because the new south wales liberal party the factional conflict within the new south wales liberal party has always been far more intense when Robert Menzies addressed the first State Council of the Liberal Party in 1945 at the Sydney Town Hall, he said, as I've got travelled around the country in, in setting up this new party, I've had, there's been internal divisions in some of these divisions. Some of them are warlike, some of them are quite peaceful. But he said nothing, nothing compares to New South Wales. That was in 1945. So because of the intensity of it, and you can only win if you are like a warrior, not an ideological warrior, a factional warrior, a thug warrior. And this is why when it comes to the, 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 the apex of the factional war is the, the party room ballot for parliamentary leader. So who's good at manipulating these things? People who've been manipulating ballots in the New South Wales Liberal Party since they were young Liberals. That's why we dominate. Has it been a great government? Okay, well, Look, the first two terms of John Howard's government were terrific, okay? But then we decided to you know, throw out endless middle-class welfare. Uh, but even despite that, at the end of John Howard's term, the, the federal government had $20 billion worth of debt. It cranks up to about $220 billion, thanks to Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. Tony Abbott comes in and, you know, he tried in his first budget and he, the party room struck him down basically because of that good budget. And then the, the Liberals pre-COVID mania had got the debt up to about 550 billion. And now who knows where the hell it is? Well over a trillion, I hear. This is under a Liberal government. I remember at the beginning of COVID mania, Mike Carlton, you know, radical left-wing nutter, sent out a long, th long thread and he said, what have we got to complain about on the left about Morrison? And he was dead right. When I go onto Twitter or social media and I see lefties, getting their knickers in a knot about Scott Morrison, I'm thinking, what the hell have you guys got to complain about? So, yes, politically they've been good, but I believe that they it's been extremely disappointing. So this is why we need a new mechanism to elect the leader. Now, uh, to a degree, uh, each uh, state Liberal Party decides pre-selections and lower, lower and upper house seats differently. Uh, New South Wales, your state operates what's termed a, a delegate system, which is a form of uh, indirect uh, democracy, though you explain in your book why that system is so easily for power brokers, hacks and branch stackers to, to take advantage of and, and disenfranchise grassroots members. 
Well, look, what, it was very archaic, the New South Wales Liberal Party. But look, after a 10-year battle, we have brought about some significant reform. So what had, what had happened up until, up until you know, basically now is that to become a, a, a candidate for a state or federal seat, um, you just had to get on the right side of the dominant faction, the dominant local faction and the dominant faction at, at head office. Well, now, after a long battle, we now have had a first and significant step towards democratic reform. So if you want to be a Liberal candidate in New South Wales in the future, you're going to have to be elected by all the local Liberal Party members that live in that seat. Now, that's going to expand how many people have a vote, hopefully by a factor of about 10. And it's also going to mean that um, a lot of more sort of people who aren't caught up in the factional war and therefore will vote on merit will be having a say on these important decisions. So that system has only just just this, this upcoming round of pre-selections will be the first where we're going to have what we call a plebiscite where everybody gets to vote. Now, this is not going to bring instant reform, instant improvement in our policies and the calibre of our parliamentarians, uh, but it's going over time, I believe, that it will be a, it will certainly improve things. Now, eventually, I want to have primaries to elect our, our, candidates for, our candidates for parliament, which is what they do in the United States, because that is, that is the most sort of pure democratic system. And that's how we're going to get really outstanding people, not just party hacks, running for parliament. And for the the upper house and senate pre-selections, how are how are they uh, decided under the modest reforms now? Well, in the past, if you wanted to be a New South Wales senator, you had, there was only one hundred and twenty people got to vote, and those one hundred and twenty people were basically the all the factional hotshots, who were most of the time very sort of weird people. Um, now, 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 what's going to happen is we we had proposed, and the membership had voted in favour of it, but it got changed. But the membership had voted that all members will get to vote for our senate and our upper house candidates. That got watered down. So now, rather than one hundred and twenty people voting, about eight hundred people will vote. But those eight hundred people are not as intensely factional as the one hundred and twenty, but not too far off it. So it'll still be a factional stitch up. Because one of the, the ongoing sagas with the uh, Liberal uh, New South Wales Senate pre-selection was the, the, the constant placing of uh, uh, Senator Jim Molan in the, the unwinnable position. He got uh, placed in one unwinnable position at the 2016 federal election, managed to flunk his way into the Senate with both Fiona Nash and uh, Holly Hughes, who is now a senator, uh, being declared ineligible. Then in 2019 federal election, he was put in an unwinnable position, uh, but managed to uh, be able to fill Arthur Zinedine's casual vacancy by uh, being uh, ele uh, elected by the members to, to fill that vacancy. Well, Jim Mullen is an outstanding Australian. And I remember first seeing Jim Mullen when Julie Gillard was the Prime Minister, and we had a massive problem on our northern border with boat arrivals. And I just saw this guy this retired military guy get on there and I remember thinking to myself, gee, this guy's impressive. And then about two years later, I hear, I see a report in The Australian and, I, and it says that he's thinking about running for the Senate in New South Wales, for the Liberal Party. I thought, well, that's interesting. I like this guy. And then I just happened to be at a function a couple of days later and I bump into Jim Mullen and I introduced myself. I said, Jim, I'm a huge fan. And I said, and I understand you want to run for the Senate. Now, the first thing I want to say, about Jim Mole and Tim is this. Look, I, I wouldn't say we're best of mates, but you know we know each other reasonably well through pop political circles in the last 10 years. And I can tell you, Jim Mole is a top bloke. He's just a really, really nice guy. He's sort of like your favorite uncle. And he's got the most impressive handshake you've ever had in your life, okay? His, his hand has you know, been firing uh, you know, bullets and guns and rifles and you know, doing things. He, he's got calluses on his hands. And he's a lovely bloke. So we had a very nice chat with him. And I said to him, Jim, let me tell you straight, as a supporter, you've got zero chance of being a senator because you're not, you're not the factional uh, power brokers aren't going to back you. He said, you sure about that? I said, yeah, I'm dead sure. And then I said, well, what we're going to do? I said, but Jim, if all the members of the party in New South Wales could get a vote, you'd come first. So you should help us in this campaign to bring about democratic reform. And I sent him through an email about the democratic reform agenda and he responded he said it's very interesting i'll have a look then i never heard from him until he lost his pre-selection and then he uh, came last 
uh, but behind some very unimpressive people. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the media was outraged. This was in 2016. So then Jim says, okay, yeah, well, let's get behind this democratic reform thing. And so he then became like the, um, the Moses-like figure of the Democratic War. He became sort of like the hero of the membership. And he was, you know, a great flag bearer because he was not somebody with a history in the factional war, but he was somebody with an extremely impressive military background and who had stopped the boats. I know Scott Morrison likes to claim he stopped the boats, uh, but really, uh, you know, Tony Abbott, through his skills, picked the right man and he stopped the boats. And remember how much of an intractable problem it was. Uh, you know, and the Labour Party said it can't be fixed. Tim Mullen fixed it in about two weeks. No more boat people. Thank you very much. So he should have had. A, he should have had. He should have been on the red carpet into the into the Senate. He should have. We should have said, Jim, be in the Senate until you die. Be be there till you're a hundred. And uh, so then he. So then Jim helped. Jim really led the, the campaign to bring about these reforms. And uh, then he. But then even after that, and he was. Uh, he got into the Senate through a vacancy. Uh, through through the just through the high court the citizenship thing they're just two fluke situations where he got into the two people got knocked out above him so he was in so he's a sitting senator and then they bumped him off again so then he ran as a rebel rebel senator um, and because he was so popular with the public and with the conservative press and the wider press like in many many ways uh, you know he he got about a hundred and oh, look I've forgotten the number now but I think it was I think it was about 150,000 votes, which was a hell of a lot more than anyone else expected. Below and the line. Below the line. And I suspect that his actual vote was double that because you know what? A lot of people that would have wanted to vote Jim Mullen would have been elderly people. And they, it was just, it's hard to vote below the line and still make your vote valid. It's easy to stuff it up is what I'm trying to say. So I bet, I bet a lot of other people want to vote for Jim Mullen. So after the powers that be could just say, oh my God, we've got this like this guy here who has, unlike any of us, the other politicians in Canberra, this is a guy who's got genuine grassroots, widespread, serious support. And so they just thought we better get him inside the tent. And that's what, and then they not tapped Arthur on the scene, this useless old Arthur. And they said, you know, just shows you how important they, they really treat the American alliance when they go and put an idiot like Arthur over there. Uh, you know, they said, Arthur, retire so we can get Jim into the Senate to shut him up. That's what happened. Now, you advocate in your book for lower house seats, both party members and supporters uh, get a say, and yeah. for the, the, the upper house, uh, uh, members, uh, all members uh, get to vote, and uh, also for the parliamentary leader as well, which we're, we've seen the introduction of this on the, the Labor side uh, with the, what they call the Rudd reforms at the, the federal level, uh, where the party room gets half a vote and so do the, the members. Though the first time Labor, uh, Labor did this, the members voted for elbow, but there was a stitch up in the party room to have Bill Shorten as a leader and look how that ended up. And uh, the New South Wales Labor Party, they recently had their leadership ele election with Jody Mackay beating uh, Chris, Chris Minns. So what you're proposing is obviously not radical in that regard, especially when you look at the, or well, the US is the, the ultimate primary system where the registered supporters, they vote on, on everything. But the argument against always is that it leads to extreme candidates uh, getting pre-selected well look what's happened with the labor party and i was very happy the day that rudd uh, brought in that reform they've they the the, the a key part of having a leadership a leadership contest <coughs> excuse me is a is a vigorous policy debate so this is what happens when the Republican Party had its uh, choosing its candidate in 2016. You had you know close to 20 candidates up there, and they're all slugging it out over policy. Now, when the Labor Party, after they lost in 2013, had their leadership ballot between Albo and Shorten, it was so boring. Okay, there was just like it was just like two two sort of gentlemen, and there was no arguments about anything. I think there might have been one televised debate on Sky. And there was just no energy. Well, that's not how to do a leadership debate. Now, the, the, the best argument in favour of a leadership debate 
uh, the leadership electing the members, is that the 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 original Westminster Parliament, uh, Britain, introduced these reforms in the 1990s, and that delivered Tony Blair, who was now let's put aside the fact that we don't like Tony Blair. Uh, he is the most successful Labor Prime Minister in their history, and he won three big election victories. And he did shift Labor significantly to the right, on particularly on economic issues. So, you know, he was good for Labor. Better than, you know, they used to have people like Michael Foote in there, you know, complete, you know, pro-Soviet Union type people. Um, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, now, uh, which I will get to. Now, what happened was that the, the Tories introduced these reforms and they had a leadership ballot, a very spirited leadership ballot, and it happened in 2001. And when I asked most people in Australia who follow politics pretty closely, none of them know about it. Now, why is that? Because on the day the results came out was 9-11. And so obviously 9-11 just sort of blacked out all other news. But the Tory party, at the time when John Howard was the Prime Minister, had a very vigorous debate for their leader, and Ian Duncan Smith win, won. Now, but after, let's talk about the, after Brexit, we have this magnificent result with Brexit in mid-2016, and David Cameron, who was pretty useless, very honourably, immediately resigned. And I thought, good on him, because, you know, he did campaign for Britain to stay in the, union, in, in the EU. It didn't happen. It's not like you can continue to be the leader of the, the, leader of the country when you've just been completely, you know, opposed to what it's chosen. And most, but most politicians in that situation would have said, uh, they would have come up with some, you know, formula of words saying, oh, well, yes, I did campaign against it, but now mm -hmm. I'm in favor of it. Okay. But David Cameron, the morning after, I remember watching it live. I had a feeling he might resign. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. And I thought, good on him. Good on him. And so they had a, they, so then what they should have had a leadership ballot amongst the membership. But they didn't. Uh, they had they, the stupid party room put up. Theresa May, uncontested. And the stupid rules in the Tory party say that if it's uncontested, then we don't need to consult the membership. Well, I believe very strongly if there's only one candidate, and I would like to see half a dozen candidates for every leadership contest, but if there's only one leadership contest, if the party room can only produce one leader, I want that one leader to go to the party, to the membership and to get 50% endorsement. Thank you very much. Uh, just so the party room can't completely, you know. Now, what would have happened in 2016 when Theresa May was elected by the party room, uncontested. She was a bloody Remainer. Okay, so why on earth would they put up a Remainer after the country, largely the Tories, have just campaigned successfully to remain, uh, to, 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 to exit? Okay, so they put up Theresa May, who's probably not a bad person, but boy, oh boy, she had a miserable time as Prime Minister, and Brexit just became this bog. And it just got worse and worse and worse, and then she had an election, and Jeremy Corbyn you know, reduced it to a hung parliament, Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much, because there was no enthusiasm for her on her own side because she was a Remainer, which the dumb party room, how could you do that? Now, so then finally, 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 you know, in the depths of the Brexit hells, Theresa says, oh, maybe I should resign. So she resigns. We have a leadership contest, which we should have had in 2016, but we had a leadership contest in 2016 by Boris Johnson, who was at Brexiteer, and had been during the campaign, and somebody who was pro-Remain, and Bre and the Brexiteer wins, you know, seventy percent to thirty percent. So we had an endorsement from his party. Then he goes and gets Brexit done. Now the membership was right, and the party room was wrong. Okay. Now another example is John Howard contested the leadership, or almost contested the leadership, on about seven occasions between 1984, 1983 and 1996. And almost on every occasion, John Howard lost badly. Okay, Andrew Peacock would smash him. John Hewson smashed him twice, like, or, or once, but Howard pulled out another time because he was going to get smashed. Uh, John, and, and he pulled out against Alexander Downer because he was going to get smashed. So the party room consistently got John Howard wrong. He got the leadership twice by default, uh, and uh, he never really won about it. And so, but then John Howard goes on to become the second most successful prime minister in Australian history. So the party room got that right. If the membership had been invited in the 1980s to vote between Andrew Peacock and John Howard, they would have voted 70% for John Howard. And because the, 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 the party room gets it wrong because you got a party, let's say you've got a party room of 80 people, 
one third of them at least, Tim, after that ballot are going to be a front bencher. And every, pe every politician is an egomaniac. And so they all want to get promoted. So they might think that candidate A is the better person for the country and more likely to win a federal election. But candidate B is to promise them the shadow defence minister. So they're going to vote for candidate B. But the membership, you can't bribe 100,000, 200,000 members of the party. You just can't bribe them. They're going to vote on merit. Are they going to vote for a more conservative candidate? Yes. In most cases, yes, they will. Uh, I mean, you know, times change and moods change. But yes, they would vote for a more conservative candidate. But it would be a conserv It would be somebody, let's say, for example, like Tony Abbott was a conservative. But when Tony Abbott uh, didn't win it with the endorsement of the membership, but just with the party room, even though Tony Abbott is a sincere conservative and a highly intelligent conservative, he sort of had to campaign as though he's wishy-washy, as though he's sort of a centrist. Now, I'm not, he said, I'm not going to cut back spending on health and ABC and SBS and everything else. If he had first had to have won the leadership by campaign, campaigning to the politically interested Liberal Party supporters, the people who've gone out of their way to join the party, and a lot of them will only join the party because they do get a vote for the membership, and that's who we want more than anyone, because they're not people who are joining the party because they want something for themselves. We want people who, having a say who join the Liberal Party because they want something for their country. And these people are nothing in it for them. They'll vote on merit. So we'll have a conservative, but with a, with, but with a conservative mandate. And I believe that that person can convince a majority of Australians to vote for them. And the, the democratic reform uh, proposal in the New South Wales Liberal Party was named after Tony Abbott's uh, electorate. It was called the Warringa Motion. Yes. Well, what had happened is, after many ups and downs and battles, the, 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 a political party's constitution, Tim, should be 10 to 20 pages. A political party, look, a, a company needs a constitution. A, a little a Boy Scouts Association needs a constitution to set the internal organisational rules. So a political party needs a constitution. You can type into Google, um, you know, uh, Illinois Democratic Party constitution or South Carolina Republican Party constitution. They're all available on the internet. They're 10 to 20 pages long. The New South Wales Liberal Party constitution uh, is, well, it was before we started amending it, was 220 pages. It was a document that actually had its origins in the 1880s when the first sort of organised conservative political parties were put together. And that document had just passed through the decades. You know, what everyone thinks the Liberal Party started in 1944. It, started in the 1880s and it just had about six name changes that's the truth john howe john robert menzies did not start a new party he got the united australia party and he rebadged it and he made a few other little cosmetic changes that is the truth so that constitution of the new south wales liberal party is this ancient document that was 220 pages it was so byzantine and opaque that the factional rats were the only ones that knew their way through it so what 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 we had to do is what the Warringah uh, constant, uh, electorate did was they went through the very hard task of rewriting that document and making it demo and putting in the reforms that we were proposing. And yes, it helped that. And that was very good of Tony Abbott to let his electorate propose that while he was the prime minister. So that's how it got the name of the Warringah constitution. Let's now uh, in or inject the uh, how Trump ascended to the, the the presidency over in the the united states because he would a person like him to become the leader of australia would have to get pre-selection in the liberal party then win a party room ballot while obviously we're a parliamentary uh, uh, parliamentary system here in australia over in the us they have the 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 presidential direct separation of powers uh, uh, trump in the republican primaries knocked out the the 15 other establishment candidates to win the nomination and even though the the party establishment didn't want him they knew they couldn't rob him of the nomination at the uh, convention and then he was able to go on to to win the electoral college in 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 2016 uh, but it just shows to go to you that the fact that even though he was described all along donald trump as as unelectable the republican party is going to be doomed if they they nominate him he won in, in 2016. 
Yes, and that story, and look, we, we also need to say <clears throat> that Donald Trump was a magnificent president because I grew up, and I want to get back to your question about the uh, election of the leader, but that, that plain citizen, Trump was the first plain citizen out of the 44 presidents preceding him. They were all former politicians or in a couple of occasions, generals, which is very political anyway, like generals that won World War II and, you know, and the Civil War, things like that, the Revolutionary War. Um, so the um, <clears throat> Trump was this plain citizen who walked off the street and won uh, to everyone's shock and was a magnificent president because I grew up with a left that said that the two things that they care about the most were uh, world peace and um, helping the poor. Well, I'm sorry, Donald Trump gets a 10 out of 10 on both, okay, in terms of lifting up things. So what I'm saying is we should have a system that is open to a plain citizen coming in and being the national leader. Now, obviously, it's not going to happen every time. It might only happen once a generation, but it is healthy. It is democratic to have it at least as a possibility that some figure can just be a very successful person in the non-political arena. Now, a lot of the time that's going to be in the business world, but it doesn't have to be. It, it, it could be anything. Now, now, in the 1980s, we remember Reagan and Thatcher. There was another great leader who we often don't remember, the Canadian Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, uh, who was very much part of part of the, you know, I, when Reagan died, uh, two, two people, were two foreigners were asked to speak at his funeral. One was Thatcher and one was Brian Mulroney. Brian Mulroney was a, a, a successful businessman. He won the party. He was never a politician. He won the, the convent because the Canadians have been electing the membership of the Canadian political parties have been electing their parliamentary leader since the 1930s. And, uh, and there's no two countries on earth more similar than Australia and Canada. If you, if you go back to the 1890s in this country when we were drafting our constitution, people think that we copied Westminster and we copied Washington. The truth is we looked at Canada more than anybody else because it's the same thing, okay, a big, big confederation with a monarchy and, a, and a, a bicameral parliament. So the Brian Mulroney was very good, okay, and, and very successful. So we want a system where, where a plain citizen, and, and I think you've read parts of the book, Tim, uh, the, where a plain citizen, you don't need to be a parliamentary leader to, to win the convention, to, to be a parliamentarian, because uh, that's the rule in Canada. You can, be, you can win the convention, the leadership convention, and become the parliamentary leader, and not be a member of parliament. So people say, well, how's that work? Well, the convention is that if, if somebody is elected, and it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And, but if somebody wins the parliamentary leadership and they're not a member of parliament, somebody in the parliament in a safe seat steps aside. They might be old. And if they have to be told, hey, look, you can be the ambassador to Japan or you can be the ambassador to Italy, the other side doesn't make it a political thing because they just got to get this guy in there. And the other side, there's a by-election, but the other side doesn't contest the by-election, so they just walk into Parliament. Now, that's what we would like to have, rather than having, why is it in this great country of 25 million people, with so many impressive people in so many different fields, world impressive, why do we have, why do we, are we limited to such a small pool of who could be our national leader? Yeah, and as I described to you, it's a, a, a the, uh, and you know as well as as well as I do, you've got to win the the, the pre-selection, which is a grueling, uh, bruising process. We just talked about Jim Mullen's uh, experience uh, that it takes a lot of of energy, which a lot of people who are successful in other fields just can't be bothered. Well, look, the the thing is, yeah, look, under the current system, if you happen to be a really uh, you know, impressive person. You decided you wanted to be the prime minister. Yes. Well, it's a very, it's a very greasy pole. You've got to get your way up. Yes. The local pre-selection is always very, very messy, and then you've then you've got to win the election, and then you get to parliament, and you're just a backbencher. Okay. Well, then you've got to move up. You've got to become a a, a, a outside front bencher. Then you've got to you know move into the the, the the senior ministry, then into the cabinet. Okay. It's just it's just. It's just one big sort of, you know, brown nosing your way to the top. Well, under the democratic ideal, if we think of Athens and Rome, you know, under the democratic ideal, we would have an impressive person who then puts themselves forward and said, you know, I think actually I could be a very good leader. And, uh, you know, 
Now, most of the time they're gonna they're gonna crash and burn, but uh, but that doesn't matter. Having the option there keeps the place more democratic because at the moment we have a closed closed uh, avenue to the to the leadership. Now let's go back to Donald Trump. He's no longer a US president. We're on YouTube at the moment, so we can't talk about uh, election irregularities, but we can say that there was a concerted four-year campaign by the mainstream media, uh, the social media through their censorship and the injection of money from all the new uh, uh, re reborn woke corporations to get rid of of Trump and that uh, the uh, they didn't care who the the other guy was it ended up being uh, sleepy Joe Biden the the oldest president ever inaugurated and they eventually got uh, uh, got the uh, got the got their man out like they like they did with with Nixon in the in the 70s and well, the Biden presidency so far has been pretty, you would say, mediocre. He's just signed a bunch of executive orders. He's just done one good thing, Biden ending the, the US support for the Saudis in, in Yemen. That's an excellent, uh, uh, probably his, his best, I would say, executive action so far. But not much else has happened. The, the Democrat Congress in the House, they're obsessed with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the new Republican Congresswoman. She's the new uh, uh, Trump that they're wanting to demonize. And then the, the Senate, which uh, the, uh, the Democrats have, well, they're, they're in the majority thanks to Kamala Harris being the tiebreaker vote, uh, but they're getting ready for the Trump impeachment trial. So they're still chasing boogeymen, it seems, the left. Well, look, they're going to, you know, they, they can't stop talking about Trump, okay? They are addicted to Trump, okay? Now, dur during the election last year, you know, it was hard not to watch a lot of American cable TV. I would, I would have watched 50% of the time I would have watched CNN. And yeah, I, I, do, I did as well. Yes, okay, because I want to know what the other side is saying. I know what my side is saying. And I was, you know, I mean, it's appalling coverage. But since the election, it's been too hard to stomach to watch them. But I do flick over for about 20 seconds, uh, maybe two or three times a day. And two out of three times, Tim, they, what are they talking about? They're not talking about the new president. They're not talking about the old president. They're hooked on it. Okay. And they just want to, they want to keep building up. It's like in the book, uh, 1984 by George Orwell. There was like this, this bogeyman. I think his name is, um, uh, and look, he was probably even a fictitious figure. Oh, I know uh, who you're talking about, and I've forgotten as well. Yes, yes, yes. But he's like the ever-present bogeyman, and he's like, you know, everything bad that ever happens is because of him, and you've got to focus all your energy on him because just think about him, okay? And that is that is what they are doing now because obviously Mr. Biden's not a very impressive person. But President, the Biden administration reminds me of like a, a duck that's swimming along on the pond and it looks like it's just going along very gracefully, but in fact, there is actually an enormous amount of energy going on beneath the surface that we're not seeing. So Biden just looks like he's going out there doing a few, um, you know, executive orders and he's, you know, just cruising along. But I can promise you, Tim, behind the scenes, the little, the, the secretaries, the assistant secretaries, the undersecretaries, the people that we've never heard of, the people who've now got executive power, they are doing things. They are re-engineering the bureaucracy so that they can bring about them. I mean, they love these mail-in ballots and they love all these rules that they've um, that they changed at the last moment. They're going to try and lock these things in, and so that and so that they they are they 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 they, they used to think that the populist movement, which which they started with the with the Tea Party in 2010. They thought it was just a little faction of the Republican Party. It then basically morphed into the Trump campaign and the Trump presidency. And they and they know that, you know, that even if uh, B B Biden has got more votes than, than Trump, he, Trump's still got an enormous amount of votes. So they're, they're thinking, you know, they, they see him as this existent existential threat and they, they particularly hated him. But he was going to, you know, he was going to drain the swamp. But they hated him because he was so successful. He was so successful in taming North Korea. Now I know North Korea hasn't changed, and the North Korean people are suffering. Okay, but the chances of there being a nuclear conflict, a nuclear bomb dropping on Tokyo or Seoul now, is like 
dropped by 90%. And that used to be something that we were always concerned about. Why did that happen? It happened because of Donald Trump. And when Donald Trump's with that little, that little jerk in North Korea, that, that, that guy that we've all been so frightened of that we thought was such, such a tough, you know, evil dictator. I wasn't frightened of him. <laughs> well, well, when you see him around Trump, and they've been in each other's presence a few times, he's like... He's like in awe of this big movie star. He's like this little, this little, this little jerk. Okay, so success, unorthodox what he did in North Korea, but successful. Now in the Middle East, ever, ever since I was a kid, way before I was a kid, my grandfather's time, there's been conflict, dreadful, terrible conflict, ancient conflict in the Middle East, okay, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And every president's tried to do something because this would be the thing that would put them up in history. Clinton tried, Bush tried, Obama tried. They've all tried. They all failed. And then Trump comes along with all his bravado and he says during the primary, and he says early on in his administration, if I'm, I'm going, I'm going to fix up the Arab-Israeli conflict. I'm the big, I'm the best uh, deal maker there is. I'm going to fix it up. I thought, okay, good on you, Donald. You try, mate. But I just thought it's, it won't go anywhere. Now then, about two years ago, the big announcement is. He's going to send over his zero foreign policy credentialed son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who happens to be Jewish. And I thought, OK, Jared, all the best. Hope it works out. Not expecting any results. And what have we got? We've got half a dozen peace agreements, bilateral peace agreements between Arab states and Israel. It's extraordinary. And two of those, uh, the, the, the Gulf states, the UAE and uh, one of the other ones, the little ones, they are basically vassal states of Saudi Arabia. This was Saudi, those guys, the UAE and the other one, I don't Qatar or Bahrain, they don't do anything without Saudi Arabia. They're all, they're all intermarried, the, the, the royal families of them, of course. So that was, that was the beginning of Saudi Arabia itself, the home of Mecca and Medina, the homeland of Muhammad, saying, hey, we want to patch things up with Israel. We want to have a permanent peace here. Now we know it's we know that the Saudis are motivated not by our love of peace and goodwill and and, and the Israeli uh, cousins, but we know it's fear of Iran. We know that and they see that you know obviously the Saudis have taken the calculation that American administrations come and go, and sometimes it waxes and wanes how much they like us. But we've got this military over here in our neighbourhood that's super duper powerful, it's called the Israeli military, and they don't like our enemy, and uh, you know, why don't we just become buddies with them? So of course it's all self-interest, but thank God it's happening. Now, now, you know, it really under Trump, there, there, you mentioned the Yemen situation, which of course is heartbreaking, but the Middle East is looking pretty good right now. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not saying there's gonna be an outbreak of liberal democracy, but as long as we can just have no war for a period, the, the Arabs have always been, back into antiquity, magnificent merchants and businessmen and builders. So if we can, if they can have peace for a couple of decades, they'll build the place into, you know, hopefully something that can evolve into a, a, a fairly liberal and a fairly democratic part of the world. So I thank Trump for that. He, he started no wars uh, during his presidency, which is the, he's the first one in a long uh, time to achieve that almost, uh, well, tried to end one in Afghanistan, which is turning into America's longest conflict. Uh, Emmanuel Goldstein was the villain uh, boogeyman that we were talking about in 1984. I mentioned before Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, well, since Twitter kicked uh, Trump off, they can't rage about his tweets. Uh, Trump, uh, he's choosing to stay silent in uh, uh, at uh, Mar-a-Lago in, in, in Florida. They also took away uh, parlor as well post, uh, post the, uh, the Capitol Hill storming on, on January 6. Uh, but they, the, the events of January 6, they, they did hope uh, both the, the, the media and the far left and the establishment Repu Republicans that this would be the end of Trumpism and uh, the MAGA movement and obviously they, they, they they've seen marjorie taylor green freshman congresswoman from georgia won uh the uh, the series of primaries there to, to get in congress i'm not sure what your your view is on her but a lot of what you read about her is 
fake news. She doesn't believe in, what's it, Jewish space lasers. She's, she, she doesn't believe in that. But there's, after the events of January 6th, the Republican base, they've, they've communicated to most of the uh, congressional Republicans that we still support MAGA, we still like Trump. And so we're seeing con uh, mega congressmen like Matt Gates. they're still making their voices heard. And the establishment Republicans such as Liz Cheney, uh, who voted to impeach Trump again, it's, it's not so easy to just ignore the 74 million who voted for Trump. Well, that's, uh, that's very true. We've got to focus on how do we win in 2024? Uh, now, I don't believe Trump is the person to do that. And me either. Yeah. Um, now, there would be a very sort of convoluted web of events where it could happen. Okay. But let's, and I think actually Trump, I know he won't, I know he won't do this, but he should say, I won't be a candidate for 2024. Because as what, for as long as he, until he does say that, he's going to suck all the oxygen out of the room so that another candidate can't sort of, Flower. Okay, so, but <clears throat> look, on Marjorie Green, I'd never heard of it before about three days ago. I saw, I saw her speech in the Congress yesterday. She says that, I think she's basically admitting that she did at some point believe in 9-11 truth conspiracies, but she doesn't anymore. She did believe in QAnon, but she doesn't anymore. And she did believe in unusual things about the Sandy Hook situation. Okay. Now, she has said in the Congress yesterday that she um, doesn't believe in all those things and she spoke against them. Okay. Well, my problem with her is this. While she might be a very nice person and a very sincere person, I don't want somebody in part in Congress who is capable of believing those things for at any period in their life. Okay. So, but I'm not particularly overly focused about her because I, bas I bet she's basically a good citizen. For every one Marjorie Green Taylor that we have, and I, I think she's learned her lesson and she's probably not stupid anymore, but I'd still prefer not to be there because I think she, she at least was stupid. Um, and, you know, stupid can be hard to get rid of. Uh, but the Democrats have got people that are like worse on their fringe and their fringe is radical and dangerous, okay? And there's like endless people in that category. So if this is just more bullying, this is persecuting the heretic, the Democrats love what happened on the 6th of January, um, you know, I, I because they're, they're trying to exploit it for all that they can. When it was it was not a coup, it was a disorganised rabble and a mob. And yes, they need to be prosecuted. But um, Trump made a big mistake. I'm sorry. By have, look, he didn't incite the violence. His words are very clear. We're going to go over there peacefully and uh, whatever, peacefully. Very clear that he said peacefully. But... The question has to be asked, why the hell have a show of force on the day of the Electoral College? Okay, that's not what we want. That's, that, that's not within the realms of constitutional norms. Okay, and I'm sorry, I supported the challenges, the legal challenges, but when the Supreme Court uh, said, we're not interested in pursuing this, uh, now, now two justices said they are, two of the best justices, and one abstained, so it wasn't a unanimous thing, but rightly or wrongly, wrongly in my view, the Supreme Court said, we're not going to look at, in, in, into this, invest, with this fraud investigation. We're not going to take it up. That was the end of the story. That uh, in our system, the monarch, the crown, intervenes in politics about once a century, which is why the system works. But when they do intervene, that's it. That's It's final because the crown has spoken. Well, in the US, this, the, the, the equivalent is, the Supreme Court, if they say they're not going to investigate presidential election fraud, that's it. And Trump should have. That was early December. Trump should have. Trump should have. Trump actually did give a very good, gracious speech to Biden at Andrews Air Force Base after Biden, just as he was getting inaugurated. Trump gave a very nice speech. He should have given that speech after the Supreme Court. Then he would have been well placed to win in 2024. But unfortunately, after all the harassment the extreme harassment that candidate Trump and President Trump faced, or the extremely unfair harassment, and despite that still being a good president, what's happened at the end is he's blown a gasket, his supporters have blown a gasket, a very small number of them, and it's been very unfortunate, but the grand old party will uh, live, live on. I mean, we only, we only you know, on paper, we only lost by about 3%, so it wasn't like a Barry Goldwater-style wipeout.
I, I agree with you that when the Supreme Court made their, their ruling that Biden was going to become president and what you're referring to on what Trump was trying to do on January 6th was get Vice President Mike, Mike Pence to throw out all the Electoral College votes, which uh, w would have been entirely unprece uh, unprecedented. And what well, you would have seen uh, Antifa and all the other Democrat aligned groups probably riot if, if that had happened as well. Uh, but in terms of uh, what Trump said to the, the January 6th rally and also Rudy Giuliani, they, they still couldn't have predicted what would happen. And warlike language in politically re uh, rhetoric, so we're going to fight, uh, that, it, it's just rhetoric. Uh, nobody expects that people are going to take it literally and people don't take it literally. People are going to commit acts of political violence. They're going to do it anyway. Well, well, look, uh, look. As we know, the, the America was racked last year by left-wing political violence, unending left-wing political violence, in in the Capitol building, I think, in at least one state, in Oregon, maybe. Um, but and and the right, you know, there, there was no violence at uh, MAGA rallies, uh, um, and you know, except it, it has been exposed since in 2016 at MAGA rallies when Trump was a candidate there would be scuffles in the audience. And, and, and it turned out that, that you know, the Project Veritas, which I'm sure you're familiar with, has since exposed this was people paid by the Democratic Party, like they were paying hobos, like $100, to go to a MAGA rally and to just start wildly fly, throwing around punches so it could get on the news, there's violence at the MAGA rallies. That's how non-violent the Re Republican Party people are. Uh, but then, of course, you know, this this was uh, Trump shouldn't have well he shouldn't have contested it past the Supreme Court he shouldn't have had the rally um, you know look I'm very proud to say Donald Trump did retweet me once and Donald Trump Jr. retweeted me once so I feel like you know if I send out a tweet to Trump what are the chances he's going to read it I'd say about one in a thousand but it's not nil about three days before the rally the, the January the sixth rally I pleaded with him I said dear President Trump you know. Uh, I believe you were robbed a million ways, uh, but Sleepy is going to be inaugurated. Don't listen to people telling you to do this. And I would point into some tweet where someone's saying, yeah, let's go crazy in Washington. I said, don't listen to this. These people are your enemies. Okay, but anyway, so look, what it's done is it's drawn a line under the Trump, the Trump era, and we have to think of who's going to be able to win. We can't have these, these radical de Democrats in there for two terms. They need to find someone, Tim, and this is the hard question, they need to find somebody that the MAGA people are going to be enthusiastic about and, and that the establishment is going to be enthusiastic about. Now, if we want, we need both wings to win. Trump pulled off the miracle in 2016 when the establishment was not on his side and he won. Okay, that's a freaking result like that's going to happen once a century when an extraordinary character comes along like Donald Trump. But barring someone in trump's league we need the establishment who i know that we're all peed off with right now because they were basically you know not very pro-trump when it mattered uh but we need those boys back on side i'm not talking about the lincoln group they, they anyone associated with the lincoln group is a write-off but we need to get you know the main the senate republicans and so forth back on side well, I, I've already been open that uh, I'm supporting Ron DeSantis to, to run for the Republican nomination in 2024, the, the governor of Florida, who, after initially uh, going for some modest uh, coronavirus restrictions when it hit uh, the West in March 2020, it came to the conclusion in September that, look, is, it, enough is enough. This virus has a 99% uh, recovery rate we're going to open and if people get sick we can manage our hospitals can manage we can uh, take uh, take care of them and if you look at florida which is open versus the lockdown state california uh, california is doing worse i mean there's still like lots of coronavirus places in florida but it doesn't fit the narrative that there's going to be mass deaths that bodies are going to pile up uh, if you you don't lock down florida has it, it it is it is not doing any worse than the lockdown states and ron DeSantis he keeps saying that everyone here is an essential worker we want our our citizens and our businesses to get on with their lives 
Look, Ron DeSantis, uh, you know, ha, you know, he won a tough race for governor a few years ago. And um, <clears throat> another important sign that someone is gearing up for a presidential run, Tim, is often if they lose weight. And uh, Ron DeSantis has lost a fair bit of weight from what I can see lately. Uh, he would be... Look, governors have a pretty, pretty good track record in becoming president. Um, but... Uh, uh, look, I look. I, I quite. I like. I like the idea of another non-politician. The figure I've got in mind is Sean Hannity, uh, because you know the MAGA people like him, and the establishment has been lining up to be on his TV and radio show for the last twenty-five years. He's very likable. He's pretty much got the same agenda as Trump, though. He's more pro-free market, which is good. I can see you've got the Austrian economics in your background there, Tim. Mm. Uh, so, you know, and yeah, that was the one disappointment about Trump. Didn't really matter that much because he cut taxes so much. Uh, but, and, but, you know, he wasn't, he didn't, I, he didn't seem to understand free trade. Um, but, um, uh, look, look, I, I like Sean because he's, you know, as we we're saying, he's a non, he's a non politician. And look, he's, people do like Sean Hannity. Even lefties sort of do like him. So, uh, well, there's also, uh, speaking of, of Fox News host, Tucker Carlson is also widely admired by the, the, the MAGA crowd as well. He's probably been one of, he's even more outspoken on, on issues than Sean Hannity. Well, look, Sean sort of took the view from the very beginning that the whole media is going to be so nasty and unfair to Trump at every second. And I feel as though Sean and Rush Limbaugh took the view Look, he's got to have someone in his corner, you know, at all times, because no one normally a president's got seventy percent of the press in their corner. This guy's got the whole press against him. So Sean just took the view: I will be, you know, every day, no matter what happens, I'm going to back this guy, and good on him. Okay, Tucker did sort of go against Sean uh, Trump a few times, but you're on right. On principle, yeah, on, oh, absolutely on principle, and you know, Tucker was probably right on those occasions. And look, I'm a, I'm a Tucker fan, and Tucker's show generally has got a few more viewers than Sean. Tucker worries me on the on the free trade issue and a few other economic issues. So, whereas Sean, I'm more comfortable with. Uh, but look, we're probably speculating. It'll probably it'll probably be Tim. We'll probably just go back to the standard lineup. That's probably Trump was probably an aberration. We're probably going to go back to the you know the Nikki Haley's, you know. Yeah. Rubio's and the Ted Cruz's. That's probably, but let's hope, let's hope we can keep it going with Trump. Now let's pivot back to Australia because there's a lot of speculation that there could be a federal election by year's end. It's going to be mid 2022 by the, the, the latest. A news poll came out uh, at the, the beginning uh, of last week, uh, which showed 50-50 two-party preferred, but news poll was wrong last time by three points, which consistently showed that Bill Short was going to become Prime Minister. That didn't happen. Uh, but uh, Scott Morrison, he most people think that he'll have the benefit of the incumbency because of the, 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 the pandemic, uh, though there is still a very hostile media uh, against him, and they're particularly... Uh, well, we've seen this past week, they've uh, ferociously attacked uh, Craig Kelly, Liberal uh, backbencher for, for Hughes, uh, demanding that uh, Scott Morrison slap him down, uh, uh, gag him. It's, it's, uh, and again, it's the, they, they've twisted what uh, Craig Kelly has been posting on, on, on Facebook. He's simply been talking about peer-reviewed studies about hydroxychloroquine and Invermec to treat coronavirus and rightly being advocating along with George Christensen, who's a national in Queensland, that the vaccines need to be vo voluntary, they need to be scrutinised by uh, our, our TGA, which is, which is happening uh, as well. Uh, but it's, it, it shows that Morrison and the coalition are going to be up against uh, the, the, the mainstream media whenever the election is. Uh, well, look, look, I have a feeling Morrison, who is not an ideologue, Morrison is a, very much a politician who just really is focused on just winning an, an election and just, you know, keeping the polls on side. He has a thin majority in the House, 
and he doesn't quite have a majority in the Senate. So he must be thinking, um, <clears throat> let's go early. Labor's got troubles. These news polls showing it's 50-50, that is a magnificent position for an incumbent government to be midway through a parliamentary term because governments win about three out of four elections in this country, um, uh, maybe even more. And when an opposition does occasionally beat an incumbent government, the polls midway through the final term show the government losing 42 to 58. I mean, that before Tony Abbott beat uh, Rudd, that's what polls have been like that for a long time. Before Rudd beat Howard in 2007, the polls were exactly the same, 40, 40 to 42 for the Liberal Party, 58 to 60 for Rudd. And uh, same thing happened in uh, with Howard against Keating. But maybe not as bad then, but my point is, when a governments win elections, but when they do occasionally lose, the bond with the people is, they're not, the people aren't just cranky, it's like they've really switched off and there's a big gap. Now, before, even when they lose, that gap narrows. So when Abbott beat Rudd, it was like 53, 47. But when you're midway through the term, if you're 50, 50 and you're the government, basically, congratulations, you've won your fourth term Liberal Party. That's how I see it. Now, I'm not particularly thrilled about that, okay, because it's a pretty useless right of centre government, okay, but, um, uh, you know, what are we, the choice is the Labor Party. Now, the, the, la the Labor Party at the last election was the worst of the Labor Party. Shorten, who was meant to be the next Bob Hawke, who was meant to be the right-wing trade union guy, who was friendly with big business, for some reason along the line, I think he just got sucked into all the anti-Trump extremism and he just thought, oh, everybody I know is like extremely woke because they hate Trump so much. So that's what middle Australia wants. When they came out with their policy platform at the last election, someone did a, a word search on the word gender, okay? And it was just like a Peter, like about 163 times in their policy document. That's what, that was all their focus, all this, all this new stuff that I don't think is particularly popular in middle Australia. So look, I think, I think that, uh, I think that Morrison will probably go, you know, after the vaccines, he's, he'll try and get it launched successfully in his, you know, I don't even think we need a vaccine, but if people want to take it, go for it. Um, but um, I suspect he'll, I suspect it'll be, look, they usually don't have federal elections in the middle of winter. So we're probably not gonna have an election in June, July, August. So we may have one in May, or we may have one in spring. I, I think Morris, I'd be pretty sure Morrison would do that. And you also have to remember how good Morrison campaigned during the, the 2019 election and uh, the, the Liberal Party director, uh, uh, Andrew Hurst, uh, ran an, an excellent, particularly social media uh, campaign uh, as well to pull off uh, uh, that uh, victory. So there is also the, 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 the campaign itself which uh, scott it's it, they they his nickname is always scotty from marketing but hey marketing helps you win an election <laughs> well look, of course you're right look, look it was an extraordinary result and it was because of morrison okay you'd see you'd see short and on the, the when, when when the federal election is on i always go out of my way to watch the channel nine news political coverage and the channel seven news political coverage I mean, I usually watch the ABC political coverage at most nights, and I usually watch Love of Sky. Um, but when it's the federal election, I want to know what the punters in the marginal seats are, are watching. Now, what I would see on 7 and 9 in the elect federal election, I would see Bill Shorten in his, you know, double-breasted suit, look, looking very serious, with 20 other people with double-breasted suits reading out some, you know, big super duper new policy deal, some big new comp, you know, it's electric cars today, you know, it's some big new thing tomorrow. And then and then they'd go to the, you know, they give equal coverage to the two two parliamentary leaders. And then there'd be ScoMo, you know, up there at the Rockhampton RSL. G'day ScoMo, yeah, would be the guy with the, with the fluoro, you know, uh, construction guys shirt on. And say, g'day, mate. Come and have a beer, mate. How you going, mate? You know, and then, 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 then you might see ScoMo have a little, uh, you know, someone might have a dig at him about the sharks because they like the North Queensland Tigers, uh, Cowboys, right? 
Okay, so that was scary. So people saw short and over here, looking like Mr. Technocrat, Mr. Serious, and here's Mr. Scomo, you know. Now, Tim, yes, you're entirely correct. That was good politics, okay? But it was, uh, you know, he won the election. Look, I'm, I was thrilled he won the election. Okay, look, I've got a little mortgage-broking business, which Bill Short wanted to shut down. So I was happy that um, uh, Scott Morrison won, okay, for that and many other reasons. Okay, but I mean, it was an inglorious victory, okay, because he had no agenda. He came out with some, with yet another stupid first home buyer policy a week before the election, and there was he just campaigned on he just campaigned on sort of being a daggy dad. Okay, well it worked. Well, I would prefer that a great nation like Australia, with a hell of a lot of challenges in the twenty first century, uh, <clears throat> domestic and international, you know, I would sort of prefer to have sort of you know quite higher quality leadership that's going to sort of steer the nation in the right direction. We ain't going to get that through ScoMo. Now, let's, uh, I mentioned uh, Craig Kelly, the, the week that he's had. Uh, there's a, uh, a lot of media commentary about whether he'll get re-endorsed as the, the Liberal member for, for Hughes. Uh, they, the, the media line is, is that uh, Craig Kelly is Scott Morrison's uh, captain's pick because he uh, made sure that the New South Wales Liberal State Executive re-endorsed Craig Kelly at the 2019 federal election. Do you think that if there was a primary in the seat of Hughes, which is in southwestern Sydney, Craig Kelly would win? Well, that is a very interesting question, actually. That is, if it was a primary. Well, typically in the US, and we've had a couple of primaries in New South Wales with the Nationals and even the Labor Party have had a few trial primaries, typically 10% of the electorate turns up. Okay, so I think given Craig Kelly's high profile, well, what had happened actually in that situation? Okay, in the US, Tim, the primaries work because the Democrats and the Republicans have the primary on the same day. Okay, so you can't, let's say you're a hardcore right-wing Republican, you can't go and vote in the Democratic primary to go and vote for a crazy lefty so that they get a bad candidate. But what would happen if we had a primary in Hughes uh, and it was an open primary, well, then a lot of lefties would go and vote against him. Okay, so we, if we're going to have primaries, we have to have Labor and Liberal primaries on the same day. But if, it, if that was the case, if there was a Labor and Liberal primary on the same day in Hughes, uh, yeah, so I, you'd be having the hardcore people vote and they would be voting for Craig Kelly. But look, I think I would be surprised if Craig Kelly wins his pre-selection, okay, because, yes, the last two times... Look, look who are these people in the Liberal Party trying to get rid of Craig Kelly? Idiots, okay? These are people who are just stacking in uh, unimpressive people who don't, aren't even interested in politics. It's just a pure brand stack. And they, um, they're not interested in politics and they just want to put in one of their mates who's going to make no impact in Canberra. I think the guy they've got in mind used to be heavily involved in the ALP, he just sort of changed parties. It wasn't because of ideological considerations, I can promise you that, because he he's the type of guy that I don't think he reads a lot of books. Um, so they're going to, uh, so it'll just be a, an ugly brand stack. But, you know, last time ScoMo and the time before that, Turnbull, facing a tough election, they didn't want to upset the, the wider conservative base. They, so they said, okay, we're going to, it was a captain's pick. But now that Craig Kelly is, um, you know, uh, got lots of enemies in the media, uh, good enemies to have in my view, um, the Prime Minister will not be inclined to save him this time. So therefore, what does Craig Kelly do? Well, option one is that he retires from public life. Well, he's got more followers on Facebook, I understand. I'm, I'm not much of a Facebooker, but I understand he's got more followers than Scott Morrison. I think he certainly did at one point. Oh, and his analytics as well are the, the highest of any politician. Okay, interesting, thank you. Okay, so, so is he gonna retire and we, we don't hear from him again? Maybe, I don't think so. Um, is he going to contest Hughes as a independent? I hope not, because I don't think he'd win. Okay, because it's um, <clears throat> independents do not have a track record at all in anywhere near Hughes. Okay, it, it, the really wealthy suburbs independents have got a better track record, and that's going back a, few, a fair while now. Um, if, look, of course, I hope he's the, he's the Liberal candidate for Hughes, OK? But if that doesn't happen, I hope he considers being the One Nation candidate for New South Wales for the Senate uh, because he needs 14% of the vote 
and Pauline can pull 14% in Queensland. One Nation has never pulled 14% in New South Wales. They did have a One Nation senator, but that was in the double dissolution election when you need 7%. Oh, Mark Latham is the state leader now. He's got a significant high profile. The, the marriage, political marriage between Pauline Hanson and Mark Latham has worked. So One Nation in New South Wales uh, has, a, has a strong presence with Mark Latham as the leader. Absolutely. Absolutely. He should... Um, uh, Mark Latham. Look, I've, I have always liked Pauline. By pure chance, I was a very junior staffer in Canberra in 1996. I was walking past the chamber and I heard the speaker say, I now call the member for Oxley and I remind the house it's her maiden speech. And I remember thinking, oh, that's Pauline Hanson. And I sat immediately above her in the public gallery to a very empty parliament, but that was the speech that shocked the nation. And, um, <clears throat> You know, look, uh, she she has she was talking about taking a hard line against illegal immigration a lot longer than John Howard was before before Tampa, and uh, she was you know so she has been right on some things, and Mark, yes, Mark Mark the former leader of the Australian Labor Party, federal leader, the guy that got you know forty eight percent of the country to vote for him to be the prime minister, yes. He brings a new level of credibility to the organisation. And I think that Craig Kelly would get 14% because he's not going to get any preferences from the Libs. They'll preference Labor ahead of him. And um, and I think and that would be good. That would be good if he was uh, in, in if he continued to be in the parliament. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, chatting with you uh, today, uh, uh, John. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you've, you've got a as as you put it all in a book a clear a manifesto about what needs to change in the the australian liberal party to to make it uh, great again and well we, we've done our best to you would say uh predict analyze and and speculate what the the rest of the year is going to hold and well the over in the US, what, the, the midterms in 2022 and presidential election in 2024, but politics is, is always unpredictable. So who knows what's going to happen in one month, let alone six months. Yes. yes. Okay, Tim, look, thank you very much, mate. I've, I've enjoyed listening to the show and I've enjoyed participating in it. So uh, maybe we can do it again in the lead up to the midterms or something. Yep, certainly. Uh, there, there'll still be a lot to uh, discuss, and in the meantime, I'll still be able to hear your uh, uh, opinions on on Sky regularly uh, as well. So I'll I always tune into those as well. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you very much, Tim. It was a great honour. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.